Welcome to the Tribe of Testimonies. Here you will find conversations with faithful Native American members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, sharing their stories and their love of the Savior. My name's Andrea Hales. I'm Navajo, and I'm glad that you've decided to come and join us today. So today, my guest is Corey Small Canyon. We met at BYU when we were both undergrads, so it's been a long time ago. I love how he tells about him uh, doing family history. Uh, you can find a, a, some of his interviews online on yeah, on YouTube, I think it's YouTube, um, about his personal family history and some interesting things about that. So if you want to look him up, you can you can do that online. But here's Corey. I hope you enjoy this. I'm on the phone today with my friend Corey Small Canyon. We were going to be together in person, but you know, life and sicknesses and stuff. So it didn't happen, but we're on the phone and we're excited, especially because this is episode 100. Corey asked me way back in March, I asked him if he'd be a guest and he's like, I want to be a hundred. And I'm like, okay. So here we are, episode 100. Corey, would you please introduce yourself in your tribal way as much as possible if it's in your language, great. If it's not, that's fine. Not everybody speaks their language, and some languages are dead. Sure. Yat uh, e Corey Smolkin in Yenishia. But for those who don't speak Navajo, because that's what I am, um, I come from the Gallup, New Mexico, not in the area. Um, my father's side... He comes from Navajo Mountain, that area down in southern Utah, Arizona border. Um, uh, I am here in Provo. I've been here for quite some time, even though I still don't claim Utah as home. <laughs> but uh, bought a home here, I have my family here. I work here, so I guess I am part of Utah, and uh, I guess I did go to Brigham Young University a million years ago, and that's where I met a lot of people. Including um, me. Including you, and a lot of your guests, too, that you've had uh, interviews with. Um Right now, I'm currently working as a teacher with the school district, uh, teaching history. Um, but uh, I have a degree in history, and uh, I also do some side work uh, with that, um, such as with Ancestry, I'll help out. When the professionals need help, they'll come to me when dealing with Native American genealogy. Um, and plus, it's just a fun hobby for me, too. I've been able to learn a lot about my family, which is something that I really wanted to share with uh, my kids as I get older and help them appreciate who they are and, uh, you know, all the blessings that are in store for them um, would you please share something that you love about your heritage as it relates to the gospel of jesus christ it can be pretty much anything a story a celebration a way of life a ceremony anything as it relates to the gospel prayer has um, has always been a staple you know, with Navajo's prayer, there's prayers for everything, ceremonies and prayers in the morning, at night, to welcome up the sun and, and all sorts of things. I think that prayer has been, like I said, a staple to be able to 
connect me to that higher power. I mean, we don't talk about Navajo deities a whole lot. We don't talk about uh, some of that stuff, but uh, I just think about some of the more meaningful prayers in my life, you know. Uh, like one of the, like I told you, one of the defining moments in my life was trying to decide to go on a mission or not. Um, the other one was uh, whether to get married or not. Um, how were you, how were you raised, and where were you raised, and how did you end up at BYU? When I grew up. Um, my parents were divorced, and so I, my brother and I, we grew up with our mom. And uh, from what I understand, my grandmother, my mom's mom, um, somehow she was introduced to the church, and she used um, the church as an opportunity to educate some of her children because she couldn't afford to take care of all of her kids. Um, so like my mother went on the Indian placement program along with her brother and they came up here to Utah and so did a couple other of her siblings. Um, they were on the Indian placement program, and uh, it was an interesting experience for them, um, positive and negative. Um, but uh, if you're going to send a child on the Indian placement program, part of the rules state that the parent has to be a member of the church. So that's what happened with my grandma, even though I don't think she was ever active within the church. So my mother, while she was here in Utah on the Indian placement program, she had a lot of difficulties, like with a lot of other children, to adapt to the changes of not having a stable life because half of the nine months out of the year you're with your foster family and then during the summers you're going back to your Navajo family and so um, she had a lot of problems with that but despite those problems she still attended church and whatnot and she raised my brother and I within the church um, down in Gallup. I guess it got to the point where she never really forced us to go to church, but she left it up to us to decide. So come senior year, I decided to apply for college to Brigham Young just because that's all I knew because that's where my mom went. So I thought might as well apply there. Wasn't really thinking it through because I didn't apply anywhere else. Mm-hmm. And BYU was accepted uh, my application, and so I ended up coming here to BYU. So did you serve a mission? I don't know if I would say I was a strong member. Um, I wasn't the Molly Mormon, Peter Priesthood type, but I still went to church, still... Um, did what I needed to. And once I saw all my friends go on missions, uh, you know, I finally um, came to the realization, uh, is this something I want to do? Uh, and if it is, then I need to do it for the right reasons. And so I had to pray and figure out for myself whether going on a mission was something I needed to do. So uh, I did that, and uh, so I ended up submitting my papers and going to the San Francisco, California mission. Um, 
and my mission was quite the interesting experience, good and bad uh, in both respects. I was playing around on Facebook. They have the feature 10 years ago, this is what you posted on this date. Um, like a week ago, I looked at that and I noticed the posting about my mission. Um, like for an example, um, Growing up, I played a lot of video games like a lot of kids do. Mm -hmm. um, a lot more than my son does now, which I'm proud of. He doesn't play video games as much. Um, and even when my when I met my wife, I used to play a lot of video games. And uh, so I guess on my mission, if you really look at the very basic parts of a video game, a fighting video game, you're, you're, you have a joystick to move the person around. You have kick and hit. Those were the very basic moves. So as long as you understand that, then the video game should be pretty easy. And so during our mission, we on P-Day, we had permission from the mission president to go and play video games at an arcade that this member owned. Really? And, uh, yeah. <laughs> And uh, I saw this fighting game. I was like, oh, that looks fun. Went and played it and ended up beating the game, which in my mind was not hard because I understood the basic fundamental rules of the video game. But my zone leader got ticked off and he started claiming that I was not doing the work and I was skipping out and coming down there to play games all week long and and everything and called the mission president and complained to the mission president and made up this big old story and the mission president got mad at me and they canceled video games for everybody because of it but you know that's just something little trivial stuff so so the whole video game thing is is i was telling my son when you decide to go on a mission, there's going to be good experiences and bad experiences. And uh, when you go to church, all you hear from everybody is how great and wonderful a mission is. And I said, that's, that's only part of the story. The other part of the story is that there's going to be hard times too. So I just said, you have to prepare for the hard times too. Growing up, we had to move around a lot. I think I figured out by senior year, I moved around at least 10 or 12 times as a kid. So moving around a lot, if I wanted friends, I had to learn how to make friends. It was fairly decent at it, which I think helped me out on my mission. We, our mission president was always pushing us to go find new converts. And my whole argument was, well, why don't we just work with the members? Because the members could provide, you know, that same, they could help us find people too, instead of just going to some random door all over the place. In some places that we've covered, you know, people have been knocking on doors a hundred forever. So I always push to do member work to find converts to the church. And I use the, you know, that skill to be able to make friends with members and, and everything, which I think it helped me a lot um, on my mission when I came back for school, you know, finding a spouse, finding work and everything. So when I got back from my mission, uh, yeah, I went, went and studied and got my degree. And I started out teaching with Utah Valley University in history up in Heber and then started working with the Provo School District. Um, and worked as becoming a teacher and 
during that whole process, I got married. I had three kids. I have an older son um, who's a junior um, and a daughter who's in eighth grade and a younger daughter who's in fourth grade right now. You know, living up here in Utah, it's hard to get back to the reservation just because life gets in the way, work and, you know, the whole nine yards. Um, but I try to get them down there. I try to teach them about their heritage. It's hard sometimes yeah. um, to do that. But that's where I lean on genealogy to show them, you know, their ancestral lines, um, to look at what type of information we could find about our ancestors and create a narrative about them. Um, and that's one of the things that I enjoy about history is creating a narrative and, and learning about the past. I always tease people, you know, there's three things you never talk about with people, religion, politics, and genealogy. Because, <laughs> you know, those old skeletons in the closet, some people don't want to bring them out. I've had all sorts of people tell me about their Native American genealogy. Um... I had a neighbor who was so excited to tell me that uh, when she grew up, they would go to grandma's house and they would have these Native American pictures all over their walls. And uh, they learned that, you know, they had ancestors that were Native. And grandma and grandpa would tell them all these stories. And then, you know, fast forward till today when we have DNA popping up. She took a DNA test and she's just like, I don't have a lick of Native American blood in me. Hmm. She goes, so who the heck are those pictures of people on the grandma and grandpa's wall? <laughs> and, uh, and I said, yeah, that's as much as we love our family. You know, sometimes we might find out things about our family that we weren't supposed to find out. Yeah. But for me, it's fun. How do you keep your testimony strong? How do you know that the church is true? Um, people always ask, you know, what I study and what I do. And I said, well, for me, it's all of this stuff I study and do is fun for me especially when I was at BYU uh, in the history department. Um, I studied uh, LDS native relations. And for me, it was fun. And people would say, oh yeah, that's fun. And I said, no, I don't think you'd like it. So you're like, no, it would be great. I said, no, believe me, you won't like it. Because it, what do you do when you start studying history and histories can be negative? And how do you create a positive story out of something negative? How do you create a faithful story out of something negative? And so uh, I always try to avoid talking about my research. Because uh, part of it was um, looking at tough subjects and tough issues within the church, such as, uh, you know, what do you do when you have leadership that are doing things that are hurting other people? I was teaching a, a lecture at, at BYU with some students there, and they said, you know, we have a wide variety of people who, and their beliefs about church leadership. We have those who think that everything a leadership says and does is, is gospel doctrine. And then we have the opposite that says, no, they're people, 
Well, they can make mistakes, and that's all right. And a large group of them uh, in this class was just like, no, whatever they say is gospel doctrine. So, all right. Such and such prophet said the University of Utah is the Lord's university. How do you BYU students feel about that? And they all got up upset about it. And I said, well, you just told me that whatever they say is gospel doctrine. He said, I think a lot of people forget what happened in the scriptures, you know, forgot the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Doctrine and Covenants, the Pearl Great Price, the Book of Mormon, that um, um, we there's plenty of stories about the prophets and apostles who are people who are called of God. And some of them make mistakes and some of them realize it and repent and continue on serving the Lord. And we have others who don't. And uh, so um, when dealing with some of the subject matter that I deal with um, in my research, um, that's what I deal with, you know, uh, some of these tough issues, you know, what exactly is church doctrine versus what is church policy when it's dealing with Native Americans and within the church. Um, how has that changed from Joseph Smith to the present? How has the blessings that were promised beforehand, are they the same or different? today for natives so it becomes interesting you know for a lot of people it's it's a hard topic when i'm dealing with all of that i have people who say well why are you still a member of the church um just like with anybody you know i've had my good times in my life and i've had some bad times in my life you know i have my neighbors who are looked down upon me for being native um right now who you know they say all sorts of things you know and uh i've had bishops who've told me that i when i was dating that I need to stick to my own kind, you know, all sorts of things. And I could focus on those and, you know, or I could look beyond that. But what's beyond that, you know, what, despite all of these issues that we've had in our lives, what keeps us going? So when it comes to the church, um, I have to rely on my testimony and i think about when i was trying to decide if i was going to go on a mission and uh the basic very basic parts of testimony are there living prophets and is joseph smith one of those and if he is is the Book of Mormon true? And so when it comes to my kids, I, I hope that uh, that's the one thing I could teach them, that I could teach them to fall back on the basic aspects of the church, the basic aspects of their testimonies, of their lives, of of their heritage, of who they who they are, because I know that I won't be able to watch them and take care of them and protect them. That they're gonna have to go out on their own and live their own lives and experience life for themselves, whether if it be positive or negative. Like with any parent, you always worry about. Our kids. Uh, 
I'd just like to take it all on, take away all their pain and misery and just deal with it and not let them have to deal with it. But that's not going to help them at all. Despite all the tough times and the hard times and everything, that's that's what I just focus on is the basics. Tell me about your ward, your ward situation, your callings and, and things like that. The church came out with a while ago, a long while ago, like 10, 15 years ago, with the gospel topics that were controversial that they were starting to address. And one of the first articles that the church put out was um, Blacks in the Priesthood. And the prophet came out and said that each word should read what the church put out and discuss it and and everything. And I was teaching elders quorum, and so I thought that was a great idea for elders quorum, and I printed it out, and and that was going to be my lesson just to read it together in class. And uh, that day for church, our Sunday school president or our Sunday school teacher didn't show up and everyone's all, Corey, you teach. Why don't you teach class? And I said, no, I don't want to. And the teacher never showed up and they kept on bothering me. Teach, teach, teach. And I'm like, look, I'm fine with making the elders quorum un- uncomfortable. I'm not fine making everybody uncomfortable (laughs) and they're like no we're fine i'm like all right okay and i said this is what the prophet said here's the article i'm gonna read it verbatim i'm not adding i'm not taking away anything here you go and i started reading it soon after the uh bishop's counselors came in and sat down and then the bishop and then the stake president's counselors and then the stake president came in and uh, soon after uh, I got called in to the bishop's office and I was told just because the prophet says just because the church says to read this doesn't mean you should do it what? And I got released. And I was like, all right. The The other thing was um, the Pioneer Trek reenactment with the kids. Um, I've never taken my kid. I've had, our ward asked over and over, and I just say, nope, it's, we're fine. And then finally the bishop came up and said, will you please go? I said, I'll go if you'll let me share some historically accurate information about the relationship on the Pioneer Trek. And we follow some of the things that Brigham Young did, like sit down and smoke with the natives. And he thought about it. He's like, nope, it's all right. I said, all right, have fun. A couple, maybe like three years ago, during Mother's Day, the bishop walks up to me and says, I'd like you to give a talk on Sunday. I said, you know what you're asking for, right? If I go up there, you're going to get me. And... We know how that's gone in the past. He said, no, I understand. And it just so happened to be Mother's Days when he's wanted to me go up there. I said, oh, no one else wanted to do it on Mother's Day. I said, okay, if you're okay with me, I'm okay going up there. And I said, okay. I said, I've been in this ward for 16 years. This is the first time I've been asked to come up here to speak. I've never been asked to introduce myself when we got here into the ward. I've never been able asked to do anything. So this is my first time. 
And I said, I don't think I'm the best person to be speaking about mothers because as much as I love my mother, I have a really, I'm not very close to my mother. I don't have the best relationship with my mother. He said, at this point, I am currently not speaking to her because that's what she wants. And I haven't spoken to her for about 10 years. So I said, but here we are. He said, with Navajos, we have a wide variety of, we're a matriarchal society. We have mothers all over. We're about the group as a whole. We're not about individuals. I say for myself, I have my mother. I have my aunts, who I call my little mothers. I have my grandmother, who I call, call my older mother. I have clan relatives who can play the role of mother. So I said, I'm surrounded by mothers. He said, even though I'm not close to my mother, I appreciate all that she did for my brother and I. She grew up within the Indian placement program, and she felt like she never grew up with her mother. And she would always complain that she never learned how to be a mother. And I said, and my mother's mother grew up without her mother because she died while giving birth to a younger sibling. So my grandmother never learned how to be a mother. And she ended up moving in with her mother's brother and his family, and it didn't go very well. And her mother died at a young age. So I say, I come from this line of women who have never learned how to be a mother. And I said that, uh, I think that has rubbed off on me because I grew up without my father. So I never learned how to be a father. And I said, but my children, have a father and they have a mother and it's because of the church and the gospel and the lord that they have a better opportunity to grow and to develop spiritually mentally and emotionally with my wife she spends time with her family and I told the audience, the congregation, the ward, I was teasing Denise. So this is what a family's like. I think that is probably one of the one of the greatest things for me with the church, with the gospel, that I have a family that uh you know because of the prophet and the lord explaining the roles of our families and how our families um, can be together forever is a great blessing in my life and that's probably one of the other main points that i you know, hope that my children will learn that no matter what happens, you know, they're part of a family. Yeah. What do you want your children and family to know about you and about themselves? When I had my oldest son, uh, I was teasing my wife. I'd like to 
name him after a, a relative, an ancestor. She said, sure, sounds great. I said, all right, sounds good. And then she stopped and she's just like, wait a minute, because she knows me. She's like, uh, you have to tell me the name first. And I'm like, no, I'd rather not. <laughs> she goes, no, you got to tell me. I'm like, uh, no. I'm like, fine. I want to name him after my third great grandfather who had a long interaction with the church. His son was the first Navajo south of the Colorado River to meet the, um, the missionaries back in the 1850s. 1852, I believe. Um, and I wrote a whole thesis on the interaction between the church and him and my third great grandfather, which didn't go very well to the point where there was a gun battle between my third great grandfather and the state president. And so after the event, they renamed my great grandfather which I wanted to name my son after. So my son would have been known as Carter White Man Killer Small Canyon. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Yeah. Uh, she didn't go for that one, huh? No, no, no. As much as I tease around, she knew better. And as much as I deal with the church and and everything like i said i just have to go back to the basics of the gospel yes there's a prophet of god on earth and yes joseph smith was one of those prophets and yes the book of mormon is true and the only way i could find that out was to find out on my own and to pray about it and to get confirmation from the holy ghost that it's true so despite all the stuff that's gone on, it's okay, because I have what I need. I have the Lord's love, and I have my family, and I have the church. What does it mean to you to know that you belong to the tribe of Israel? As a historian, as someone who's looked at LDS native history, researched it, studied it, someone who's dealt with DNA and how DNA has played a role within genealogy and history and, and everything. I look at that question a little bit differently, but uh, I guess it really doesn't matter if we're literally blood lineages of Israel or adopted into it. It's just good to know that the blessings are available, the promises that the Lord provides us. It's all about family. The tribe of Israel is about family. The church is about family. Being Navajo is about being uh, is about family. We have our bread, blood relatives, and we have our extended relatives, and we have our clan relatives, and we have our church relatives, and, and everything in between. Yeah. Thank you, Corey. Thank you for your time and for the insight that you've provided us and for just all the things that you were real and sincere with us. So thank you. This is episode 100. I can't even believe it, guys. 100. When I started just shy of two years ago, I really hoped that things would look like they're looking right now, where I would be able to interview people that I never knew that 
I would um, be able to make new friends that I could help uh, spread the gospel. I also really wanted to please Heavenly Father and to satisfy the Holy Ghost because he prompted me to do this and to thank my Savior for making the atonement a reality so that I can be with my family forever. I'm thankful for all of you who have participated and listened and shared and been a part of this this journey. I I just mentioned the Godhead and I am so grateful for them that they are individuals and that they each that I have a relationship with each of them. I'm trying to to serve them. I'm trying to to please them. This tribe of testimonies is is my gift back to them. It's so small in comparison. I just want you to know that I'm grateful for each of you and I look forward to another year with you. Please enter the the giveaway. There are multiple ways to to have entries. I'm going to be pretty liberal with with that uh, with those entries and uh, I'm just thankful for all of you and I hope you have a super wonderful awesome day Tribe of Testimonies is not sponsored by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints the music is a traditional hymn Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing arranged and performed by Kyle Forsyth I would love to hear from you I would love to hear how this podcast is affecting you And I'm always looking for guests. If you or someone you know would be a great guest, you can reach me at tribeoftestimonies at gmail.com.